The acronym ITER stands for International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's also the Latin for the way. And the way forward here is for near pollution free energy for all. ITER's journey began at the height of the Cold War, when US President Ronald Reagan met the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev at the Geneva Superpower Summit in 1985. I'm certain General Secretary Gorbachev and would agree that real confidence in each other must be built on deeds, not simply words. The two cemented closer ties, and as well as signing agreements on air safety and environmental issues, they formally recognized and emphasized the importance of thermonuclear fusion for peaceful purposes. Project ITER was at that moment officially set in motion. Now, the EU, the US, Russia, China, India, South Korea and Japan are full members, or domestic agencies as they are called, working on a project that aims to replace carbon-based energy with a new nuclear option. But what exactly are we talking about here? Well, nuclear fusion is the reaction that gives our sun its energy, and scientists want to replicate that process here on Earth, and it all starts with an atom. All atoms consist of electrons surrounding a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. And in every nuclear power station currently in operation, a free neutron is sent on a collision course with the nucleus of an atom, usually a large one like uranium or plutonium, splitting it into two. This process of splitting or fission creates energy, which nuclear power stations use to heat water that is then used to generate electricity. Even better, during the fission process, more neutrons are released and they continue their trajectory, hitting and splitting other atoms, creating a nuclear chain reaction and a stable and sustained release of energy. Of course, some of the uranium atoms capture neutrons produced during fission and they create radioactive waste, which is isolated until it can decay. Nuclear fusion is the direct opposite to fission, and instead of using uranium atoms, this process uses atoms found in a substance that makes up 71% of the Earth's surface, water. Hydrogen, the H in H2O, is nuclear fusion's raw material. Specifically, heavy hydrogen atoms such as tritium or deuterium are used. In fusion, these atoms are sped up, heated up and slammed into each other to create helium and a large amount of energy. Yes, fusion does produce radioactive waste, but in contrast to fission, the waste has a much shorter lifespan. So, what's the problem? Why aren't we just creating energy out of seawater now? The journey of nuclear fusion starts with this man, Albert Einstein, and his most famous equation. David Campbell, ITER's Director of Science and Operations, explains. E equals mc squared says that you can convert mass into energy. So if you take, in particular what we're doing here is, we take deuterium and tritium, uh, we uh, basically fuse them at high temperatures, they produce a nuclear reaction, you get a helium uh, nucleus plus a neutron, the mass of the neutron plus the helium nucle uh, nucleus is a little bit less than the sum of the masses of the deuterium and tritium. And it's that little bit less that's the energy you get out of the fusion reactions. It's a very small amount, it's like four parts in a thousand. Mm. Um, but it actually is a very large uh, um, amount when you compare it with what you get from burning coal or burning petrol, you know, you know so it's, that's why it's so, so attractive. What's being built here in the south of France is a machine that will spin atoms very fast and at such high temperatures that plasma is created. It's within this plasma that the atoms are slammed into one another, creating energy. The machine itself is based on a Russian-designed tokamak, a Russian acronym that stands for torus-shaped magnetic chamber surrounded by coils. To get the nuclei of deuterium and tritium fused, you've got to get the uh, gases very hot. The sun produces fusion in the core at 15 million degrees. Um, we actually need somewhat more than that. To get deuterium and tritium to burn, you have to produce temperatures of 100 million degrees. At those sorts of temperatures, you don't have uh, atoms anymore. You have nuclei, uh, ions, and, uh, and electrons. So you have to get the, the plasma very hot. And we have various ways of doing that. You can heat it with electric currents. You can heat it with microwaves. You can heat it with particle beams. So you get the plasma very hot. 
when you get it hot, of course, you've got to have a way of confining it. You can't just put it in, you know, put it in a microwave oven and get it hot. Um, and that's where the magnetic fields come in. Uh, because we've ionized the particles at such high temperatures, we're confining them through a very strong magnetic field. That's the tokamak, the magnetic field device that confines this hot plasma. It was at the end of the 1960s that Russian scientists revealed their big breakthrough in the understanding of the properties of plasma and nuclear fusion. Experiments over the two decades that followed didn't exactly live up to the hopes of many. Creating plasma still eluded them. It wasn't until 1997 that the joint European experiment JET, based in the UK, fell just a factor of six short in the ignition conditions of a plasma. The breakthrough proved that creating fusion energy was possible. And so the elusive holy grail of designing a machine that could produce more energy than it took to run began. In 2007, work began in the south of France on ITER. The idea was to build the biggest tokamak in the world and produce 10 times more energy than it would take to power it. You can figure out pretty easily what you need to do to get more power out than you put in. There's three key parameters. There's the temperature of the plasma, uh, of the ions. There's the density. And there's a parameter called the energy confinement time. Um, and the easiest way to think of that is how long does it take the plasma to get cold if you turned off all the heating? So the, the parameters we've designed either for are 1 to 200 million degrees. Typical densities we can achieve are about 10 to the 20th particles per cubic meter, which doesn't mean anything in absolute numbers, but to give you an idea, the particle density in the atmosphere is a million times that. So it's a very, very tenuous plasma. This third parameter, the energy confinement time, is the tricky thing. We don't really have a good way of, of calculating that from first principles. But all these experiments that we've done over the last 50 years have given us a very good physics basis for knowing how we extrapolate from the existing devices to ITER. So we can extrapolate from the existing devices and we predict that the energy confinement time in ITER will be about four seconds. If you put those numbers together, the temperature, the density, and the energy confinement time, you get a parameter that's called the fusion triple product. And that number tells you basically how much more power you'll get out than you put in. To build a power plant, we estimate that we're going to need a fusion power amplification Q of about 30. Wow. So if wow. we can produce 10 in ITER, then we're a long way down the road towards producing a fusion power plant. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.